Hey everybody, I'm Natalie. And I'm Max. And we're cruising Israel for ILTV. Max, you've been living here for how long already? About a year and a half. Okay, so that means you definitely know about the Israeli national sport by now. Ooh, we're actually finally gonna go film the camel racing today. No, clearly we've learned on this show that yeah. Israel is much more has much more than no, just I camels. wanted to bet on the camel. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know that there's no camel racing, but right. I actually, you've piqued my interest. I don't know what the national sport of Israel is. Well, I'll tell you, Max. That's what I'm here for. It's called Matkot, the oh, fun matkot. beach sport. Sure, you can't go to the beach without seeing and hearing the Matkot. Mm -hmm, so I take it that means we ought to head to the beach, huh? Let's go, Max. Cool. The glorious Tel Aviv beaches are a perfect setting for all sorts of outdoor activities, from paddleboarding to surfing, and we cannot forget the notorious beach game, Matkot. Matkot is the Israeli version of paddleball that has everyone from amateurs to professionals hooked. Today we're going to go visit the place where some of the best rackets are manufactured, and maybe we'll even play a little. Matkot has been dominating Tel Aviv's coastline for almost a century. Here you'll find sport and fitness are the central focus of the 14 kilometer long beach. I'm in this hobby uh, more than 30 years. As you can see, I'm not uh, young. And since then, I'm uh, every weekend, I'm playing Matkot on Friday and Saturday the whole day. The sounds of the rubber ball being whacked back and forth can be heard throughout the entire boardwalk. The game isn't played against each other, but rather working together to reach a common goal. The main point in this uh, game, there's no competition in general. It's two people or three that were uh, fighting for one thing, to keep the ball in the air as fast as possible. No competition, no scores. Usually, uh, in professional game, one do the attack and one do the defense. Now I do the defense for Ravi. Also, we have a professional racket for a, a defense and professional market for attack. So now it's my turn to play. Okay, you're welcome. Yes. A few tips, small tips, will make your uh, game much better. First tip is to wait for the ball. Don't rush to the ball because if you rush to the ball, your hand will go down. Second, when you hit, hit uh, towards to the uh, defender face. The racket have to finish in the face of the defender. So this will, yes. <laughs> You won't uh, hit him, don't worry, he's too professional. I then played against one of Israel's most professional players, who is the foremost manufacturer of the carbon matkot in Israel. Everything starts from the wood. Yeah, this is the original. 80 years ago, we start in, it started in Israel, mm -hmm. and the name is called matkot. I, I play like uh, oh, 40 years, my father brings me, I teach my children, my wife, is a professional, she's a professional player. Really? I meet my wife in the beach uh -huh. with the mascot. Typical I... Tel Aviv story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now there's only one rule. Refrain from letting the ball hit the ground. You ready, Avi? Yeah, I'm ready. A 30-minute game can burn up to six calories and playing on the beach will give you that sun-kissed glow. The first, the first rule that, that I teach the students, it's all, only to look at the ball. That's it. Doesn't start, matter how you hold it, it's just uh, the main at the focus start, of the ball. No matter, not, nothing. Also, only look at the ball. If you look at the ball, you, you understand the playing. So from where do these paddles come from? I make them. Mm -hmm. 
I have a factory, you have a lot of uh, rackets, mm -hmm. professional rackets, the best rackets and wood rackets that from everything is started. So let's go check that out. Let's go. Seven years ago I decided to open and do matcos. I start with a wood racket. It's a wood racket who have 80 years, 80 years in Israel playing uh, matcos. And after that I, I start to make professional matcos to all the best players in Israel. The matcot are traditionally made of wood, but as the game advanced over the years, the professionals needed something a little more durable. This is from a, a real carbon. Four piece carbon each matka, and very, very hard, very, very good for a tech. You can keep uh, one matka from carbon for 10 years, 12 years. I, I play with my matka uh, seven years, the same matka. This is a fabric, uh, this is the carbon, carbon. Mm -hmm. it's called K3. Uh, so four sheets of this go into each matka? Four pieces from this mm -hmm. for each matka, professional matka, it's called full carbon. The matkot paddles are shipped overseas to countries that have also picked up this beach sport. Natalie, I can't believe you were such a great Matko player. Who knew? <laughs> Thank you, Max. You should have played with me. That would have been fun, <laughs> but who would be making sure the camera didn't get sand on it? Right, right, um, right. <laughs> So, what's next for us today? Well, Max, by now we both know that Israel has many beautiful sights to see, and what better way to explore it than... By a Jeep? Exactly, by a 4x4. Um, we're going to meet up with a very knowledgeable tour guide, and he's going to... Talk to us about the place. Cool, let's see some historical sites. Let's That's do it. Good. Today we're going to go on an exhilarating Jeep tour, and what better way to see the country than with a 4x4 and a pretty knowledgeable guide? So, well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, tell us what we are going to see today. We are going to adventure. We intend to go on an ancient road mm -hmm. between Emmaus and Jerusalem. This road was the main road. This is route number one of today on the ancient time. In this route, we will travel on time. We will find sites, give us a story from the second century before count 80 to the 20th century. This is an amazing adventure of religious nature and Israel. Yaron combined his passion of Israel and thrilling Jeep rides to create a fun off-road adventure through the ancient roads which were active thousands of years ago. Okay, so we're going way uphill now. How safe is this? Uh, the truth is we have about 90% 90 of succeeding. 90%? Yes, this is the Success truth. Success rate? So I hope you hold yourself tight because we are going uphill. Put your seatbelt on, Max. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Are you ready? So we finally made it to the top of the hill and it was a bumpy ride. Why don't you tell us what we can see from here? It's in a magnificent view. This is the reason we, re we go up. Yeah. We are looking on the north side of Ayalon Valley and in front of us we see a ruins of a crusade fortress. The greatest part about exploring Israel's history is the many archaeological sites, fortresses or ruins you may see at every turn, considering the various empires that have ruled the land.
Well, we're at the very first stop of the ancient trail. Why don't you tell us at which time period we're in? We are in the second century before count. We are in the world time, it's called the Greek period of time, after the Alexander the Great. In the Israeli period of time, it's called the Hashmonaim. Hashmonaim, Hashmonais, I think in English. Hasmonians. in English. This period of time, it's after the revolt against the Greek. This is the story of Hanukkah. It's happened here. Yep, the time uh, of the second Jewish temple. The time of the second Jewish temple. The, st the temple is still standing. And in this story, on this place story, is the, the story of the revolt, the story of Bakhides, the Greek army leader, who in the end win, killed Yehuda Maccabee, and built back a mouse that burned five years before that. The sign besides us recites a chapter from the Hasmonius book, demonstrating how the Greek leader rebuilt the fortress of a mouse. When we arrived to this place, we climb uphill. The uphill was the walls of Bakhides. On the left side, there were towers. In here, the soldiers live. And from here, they defend this place. If we look through the gate, we see route number one of today, the route to connect between the major cities of Israel, Tel Aviv on the west and Jerusalem on the east. This route is the route of today. Just like Route 1, the ancient road of the second century was also between two major cities of that time, Jaffa on the west and Jerusalem on the east. Today it's not the same way, but still with a bit of imagination, you can see it rising up. Let's head back to the Jeep. Yeah, we have a lot to do. Tell us how far it goes back. On the scale we spoke before, mm -hmm. this timeline. is in the timeline. This is from the end of the second century, the beginning of the third century, to count until the fifth, sixth century. Okay. So this is the period the of end time. End of the Roman period. Mm -hmm. Very nice. We learned something today. Uh -huh. It's the end of the the end of the Roman period of time, the beginning and all the Byzantine period of time, and. You don't believe what is it? Let's try to guess. What, try to guess what is it? Um, well, it has all these different door openings. It was arch. They collapse. This is a spa. Really? This is a Roman ancient spa. Ancient spa. And then further in the Byzantine period of time, it was just a reserve of water. So how can we tell that this was that this is dating back to the Roman times? The archaeologic dig this place, found evidence, and the evidence tell them what is the period of time, the latest one and the earliest one by the, the levels. Usually in this time, period of time, it's full of water. Oh, this wow. year was dry year, this is the problem. Usually it's full water and there is stream goes down here. So you could really see that it was a, a bath house, Yes, a it's, it was amazing. It's really amazing, look at the arch inside. Look at the stone plates. All right, now we're fast forwarding to the 8th century. Tell us what we could see behind us. On the 7th century, the Mediterranean was changed. Mm -hmm. The Islam is beginning. Muhammad started his conquests from the south and arrived to Israel. In the mid of the 7th century, the story says that he get to Emmaus and his army is, was all around. Mm -hmm. And there was a flag. 30,000 people died, one of them called Ibn Jabal. 700 years later, the Mamluks, the second period time of the Arab, arrive after the Crusades and they make a road, a, all the country, a lot of roads, and they put a point of interest on the road. Mm -hmm. They remember the story of Ibn Jabal from the first period of of time from the Muhammad time and they make a building for his grave. This is the grave of Ibn Jabal according to the tradition. There is no grave inside this building. We are not sure there was a grave in the past but all around 
all the around is a lot of graves. Arab graves is in nearby. So how do we know that this building dates back 800 years? If you see above the entrance, you see the sign. Mm -hmm. If you look at the sign, this sign, we know the name of the Mamluk leader who make this sign. This is his sign. Wow. Because of that, we know that he built this place. Our houses don't last for 800 yeah. years. Well, it's made out of these big stones and it's the old style with the, the arches and the doorways. Yes, and all, all of it shaped very nice. At the end of Yaron's tours, he likes to collect some flavored herbs and prepare some tea. Yes, this is the one. This is the fennel. In Hebrew, anise. Ah. Yes, it's very <laughs> minty flavor. Oh, and there's a snail on it, a baby snail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> leave, him, leave him on the ground. Let him live. Yeah. Let him live. Yeah, so this does, it could bring a strong taste to the tea. What kind of other herbs are we going to be collecting for our herbal tea? We have a Zotalevana. It's a Hebrew name for a white essential oil herb okay. that we use it. It is very good in the taste. You will feel it in the tea. And of course, we have the silver. The silver is a sage. Spe a sage. It's a special herb who give the the good, healthy mm -hmm. feeling. It's tasty and it's very healthy. So, cheers. cheers. Yaron customizes his tours and highlights the most fascinating sites according to the group's preferences and reaches almost all parts of Israel. We combine the classic tour for the, all the places that people arrive, uh, the religious places, the historical places, with the off-road. We combine the nature with the people. We mix between an ethnic tour to a classic tour. The idea is a lot of knowledge. We speak a lot, sorry, with the Israeli English. A lot of Hebrew inside, but some people think it's charming, some people think it's not good enough. You will decide when you see the show. Max, you hungry? Starving. I've barely eaten. All we've been working all day. Yeah, we had a very long day, and now it's the time to eat. Yeah. So let's how would do you, some eat? We'll how would you mind. feel if we went to some Indian-inspired vegan? Restaurant? I would feel optimistic that they're gonna have <laughs> something really great. Sounds yeah. good. You wanna check it out? Yes, of course. You've That's been trusting good. me for months now. I've been taking you to amazing restaurants, so trust me one more time. You've never done me wrong, man. <laughs> let's go. vegan wave that has hit Tel Aviv, we decided to come to a restaurant that combines organic vegan and Indian cuisine. Dosa Bar highlights the southern Indian street food called dosa. I think we should give it a try. The head chef and owner of restaurant Dosa has traveled to many countries around the world, but always found herself returning back to one place, India. I think it's the only place I feel that I can uh, go by myself, and because I know no one leaves you by yourself in India. You always travel with people that you meet there. Amazing people. With India's very diverse climates in different parts of the country, they can produce many different types of spices. Each region of India has their very own distinct and rich cuisine that vary significantly from each other. There is Indian food and there is South Indian food. And South Indian food it blew my mind. When you get to the South, it's like you have all these flavors in one bite. 
Today you can find the same genuine flavors of India right here in Tel Aviv. Southern India's cooking is based around rice and lentils, and the center of all this is the favorite southern street food called dosa. Dosa, it's a crepe uh, made out of uh, rice and a lentil called uradal. You soak the things and then you grind them and then you let it ferment. And then there you have the dosa butter. So it's like, um, it's full protein and it's gluten free and it's, it tastes like a, some kind of bread. Khan's love for India's southern flavors inspired her to open up an Indian restaurant. When I came back from the trip, uh, I couldn't believe there is no place to really get a dosa. Because why not? You can get there everywhere. You know, how complicated can it be? And then I got, I was diving into the dosa butter. It's a, it's a project, but I fell in love with the making of this because it's, uh, you need to know what you're doing. Now I'm waiting for Khan to prepare the Indian street food. And even from outside of the restaurant, you can smell the delicious, authentic Indian spices. So, can't wait to try it. The traditional dosa is served with a filling of potatoes, onions, and different spices. I wanted this place to be very loyal to the tradition of the South Indian food. And I wanted to have more versions of this dosa because you can do everything with the dosa. You just can put everything inside or aside. You can have it sweet. Look at this dish. It looks amazing. So what do we have here? It is the tradition of masala dosa. You, have, you can open and see we have this uh, masala of Ooh. potatoes inside. And this is great, and this one has a more of a purplish and color. This is, we call it the purple. Okay. Uh, everything is purple here, everything is with beetroot. Mm -hmm. You have beetroot in the butter, and you have this uh, beetroot tahini. This is more, more of a Mediterranean. It's with the uh, datar. This is the co coconut and the carrot chutney, okay? okay? You eat every bite with the chutney. Now it's time for some dessert. I call this dessert kulfi nufi. It's a spiced uh, cream from cashew with uh, turmeric. Wow, turmeric in the dessert, that sounds interesting. It is. <laughs> <laughs> you, okay. do, you can't really feel the turmeric. Maybe uh, uh -huh. you mostly feel the cardamom. Mm -hmm. And the uh, base is made out of uh, rice krispies and dates and almonds yeah. and uh, coconut. I really love the presentation. Oh. It looks like a <laughs> flower. So the way to eat this is to slice it straight through. And I'll just eat. lift it and have it. Do you have a cream? Ooh, have there's a cream? cream in the middle. Is the turmeric what gives it that yellow color? It is. Mm -hmm. mm. I love the crunchiness, the sweetness. Israelis and tourists alike also seem to be taking a liking to Dosa Bar. As a frequent traveler to India, I can really tell you that you know uh, Dosa really does it for me because it really brings me back the, all the good tastes and all the good memories from uh, Goa and from uh, Delhi and you know Bangalore. I really love to come here. In this place, I first of all know that I'm going to get the very fresh food, very unusual Indian food. So, for those of you craving some authentic Indian flavors, Dosa Bar is the place. Well, that's it for us this week. Thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Cruising Israel. And don't forget to catch us next time as we cruise the country and show you the best Israel has to offer. Bye-bye.